here. Well, let's, because, you know, there are times when it's obvious. But there's a lot of times where, you know, you have to do that sense-making process. You have to figure out, well, what does this really mean? Mm-hmm. I find that's where people get really hung up, is they're like, well, if we just have more data, the data, like as if the data is magically going to tell us exactly what to do and how to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> and, uh, very rare is that the case. Isn't that foundational sense making still in the service of making decisions at some point? Isn't like understanding the subject area, subject matter area, or the context, or the users, or something like that? Like in the end, that gets deployed in the making of a decision of some kind, right? Hmm. I think that's other. Otherwise, it's it's fun, I guess, if you're into research, but it's not really. You know, I, like I find that as well. Sometimes I, I like I'm reading a book or something, usually three or four at a time. And every once in a while, like, oh, why am I reading this? You know, yeah. you have to make the conscious decision to say just for my edification generally or this is applied. And then you kind of give yourself a break and you go, I'm just reading this because I'm kind of interested in, you know, post-capitalism or something like that. It might not really help me so much, but I really want to know like what's happening in the world. But yeah, I mean, yeah, and sometimes you just don't know how useful something will be in the future, but it's not useful right now. Uh, but at some point it will be, and you never know. So uh, it's sometimes better to, yeah, let yourself, you know, be open to something, and maybe use it at some point. Like knowledge, knowledge hoarding. Yeah. Knowledge well. what? Or at least to make sure that you are a bit more aware of the biases or certain assumptions that are made in in these product decisions or whatever decisions uh, mm. we have to make, because this is a big one. I um, always worry whether or not we are um, constructive enough and whether we are too how to say, too subjective and we try to be <clears throat> as objective. I mean, to balance the subjectivity with objectivity when it's possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, recently we had to work on one project when we were asked to help a client make a brand valuation between two brands because they were merging and so they didn't really know which brand to keep mm-hmm. and the the obvious direction was okay let's talk to, to customers and let's talk to partners to figure out what they think but I was like we also need financial data because no matter what the, com- the, the customers and the partners tell you you have to balance it with some objective data just to see if there is enough growth if the company is performing what are the the hard statistics i mean hmm. subjectivity will take you so far so um, but they were like why do you need that isn't talking to customers enough to figure out which brand is more valuable so uh, it took us a while to convince them that you need more than just talking and surveying customers that's, mm. that's kind of frightening that that they would not understand that there's a so they, they were actually thinking only of net promoter score. I'm like, what? You're going to make an M and A decision on the net promoter score? I mean what? I'll never put oh my, my money on, on any any decision like that or even put my name associated with uh, such a big decision. And yeah. they're in uh, in insurance business, so actually brand is really important when you sell insurance packages. So it's not to be taken lightly, but uh, for your point, this research and this analysis, they really wanted to streamline and get to the bare minimum, but I don't think that's enough uh, mm. to make this holistic understanding of the brand equity. You, you need more than that promoter score. That promoter score is just a, a fraction. But, uh, yeah, something, something that I see like I don't know why, but it, it apparently is uh, la- largely shared as a good metric to be focused on the net promoter score in the insurance world. I don't know why. Like they even compare themselves to other competitors' net, uh, you know, net promoter scores, and they have like this market market value NPS market, and they compare themselves to that, and it's so volatile and so. I mean. At the end of the day, it's just uh, so partial as an information. So how can you relate it to any, you know, proper brand decisions or even service um, quality that you that you have? Like, it, it's 
I mean, it's, yeah, it's really not a good metric. It's really no, not a good I mean, metric. It's, yeah. it's, it's, completely, um, it's completely dependent on the point in the journey at which you ask the question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. So it's, it's, yeah, no, it's, oh, I got the, I got the, I, know, I feel a little nauseous. <laughs> <You're here. laughs> that's, that's phenomenal. I think, well, first of all, I didn't, I'm not in the insurance kind of game at all, so I, I find it interesting that there might be an outsized kind of reliance. Yeah, for me, it was also yeah. a new a new industry, but I was like, what? Yeah. You won't look at the performance data and financials? To me, this was and, like uh, almost <laughs> absurd. And for most of them, they have just just that as an indicator of customer satisfaction is, you know, <laughs> big. I was like, how about customer acquisition costs? Can we talk about that? And they're like, what? No. It <laughs> <laughs> was not very popular. <laughs> uh, well, on that point, they, they like yeah. to use like big numbers, like, you know, big general numbers, like it, it costs 10 times more than uh, to acquire a new customer than uh, retaining it, you know, some, something like that. But it, it provides no actual cost for the company itself, what it means to acquire a, a new customer right now. You know, it's like, it's just mm. a ballpark numbers, you know, it's, it's just that. Yeah, it's weird. I agree. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, with a lot of stuff, though, that, I mean, I deal with this all the time is that you see people who want to evaluate something, they want to study something and they they have an idea of why uh, of metrics they want to use, but they mm. really have no idea why. Like it's it's important. Well, why is it important? Well, because somebody told me it was important. Well, you know, like it, that, that, it's that kind of thinking. It's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. And And people that are even very scientifically based. They do stuff because it's the industry standard, and yet you ask them, well, have you made a decision based on this data before? Well, no, but we need it. Well, why do you need it? Well, we need it to make decisions. Have you made a decision based on it? Well, no. <laughs> but we, like, and it just, you can see this is a circle. And it, it and I'm not, that's not even being that flippant. It really does come down to this stuff. But if we don't have it, it's almost like a security blanket. If we don't have this data, what are we, what of? Yeah, they want to be indemnified <laughs> of any decision made for the future. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, I I would love to, I would love in my company to have the financial means to be completely indiscriminate and arbitrary about my activities like so many of these organizations I work with and like they just spend tons of money on stuff that has zero value but it looks like busy work <laughs> it, it generates data which means nothing if you don't use any of it yeah it's, it's shocking and and most of the time they have more data than 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 what is u- useful actually they don't have like the one that you look for but they have a bunch of other data that, yeah. you know, that is used for nothing, actually. And it's useless because as soon as you try to plug in uh, th- those those information, you realize that, it, you know, it provides no actual, you know, ways yeah. of understanding whatever you are trying to understand. So it's so weird. And I, I find, you know, recently some someone on LinkedIn shared with me, like, um, a, a book. It was It, it is called, like... Um, um, ecological um, rationality and um, and I, 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 I think I I understand I understand like it's not new the subject is not new but the way it was framed it was really interesting and this is idea of um, in a world you know dr- driven by data and where data is everywhere um, having less data is actually better for decision making than than you know, look, seeking for more. Oh yeah, relying on few oh, few data, but the useful one. Again? Sorry. Say, sorry, say that again. So, in a world uh, where you have like a, a, a lot of data, mm-hmm. having less data, having just a few ones, but the useful ones, mm-hmm. is better than 
than, ha than seeking for more data, which is actually what most business is doing right now. It's like, we need more data. We need big data. We need a lot of data so we can make decisions. But actually, yeah. this is the opposite because at some points, it's um, it's a trade-off. The more data yeah. you have, the more time you take to to understand it, and it's all the time you don't take to you don't you don't make any decision, you know. So it's in the end, it's not always um, a good um, endeavor to 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 look for more data. Well, no, but the data should follow the metrics that you that align with what you consider to be success. Right, I think yes. that's where it falls down a lot of times. Right, it's like <clears throat> the people don't know what they're. We're, we're working with a client on that, like right now. We have the opposite problem in that they have no data, mm. or that they they kind of like built their app and then just out of the box, kind of tied it like tied it to analytics, and it's kind of like it, it's just not smart enough. Like the data is it's mistagged. It, it's not consistent between their iOS and their Android app. It's like there's all kinds of like digging that we have to do. But the way that we're fixing it is piece by piece. We're fixing it based on the experiments we want to run, mm -hmm. right? So we're not going to fix it all at once. We're going to basically say, okay, like you need, we need this metric of this like end result now, and yeah. and we need the funnel that gets to that. So we're just going to tag those things, and we're slowly going to fix your tagging internally, you know, as we as we run the experiments. Mm -hmm. right? But I think to to me that problem is is always the the step above, which is not knowing what the metrics should be. <laughs> or, or chasing vanity metrics, right? That are, no. you know, that, that are not, re not really useful. But, but the, th the thing is like, um, most of the time someone asks for something, but they don't ask for, the, for what they are actually looking for. They ask for a mean, already like a well-formed means to acquire the information that they, they, be they believe they need. Like so, uh, like you have the 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 like the um, the C suite that asks you for information about uh, the customer. And they just don't ask you for for information. They they tell you you need to run a focus group so we can understand this. And but why a focus group? Who decided that? <laughs> Based on what information? Like, is it the best thing to do? No, it's 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 not. It depends on on what information you need to 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 find, right? To, to be fair, focus groups are generally not the right. <laughs> yes, like, exactly. They're, they're in this like strange in between thing where it's not statistically significant data, but you're not also getting the unvarnished feedback because there's a yeah. group and there's group pressure and there's like. So we tend we tend to skip them like altogether. It's either like surveys, it's either, like like kind of data surveys or one on one interviews. We rarely yeah. rarely do focus groups for that reason. Uh, yeah, it's it's an example. It's like it's it's like they tell you exactly which um, methods you should use to find what they are looking for. Yeah. But what they should ask is not the solution. They should ask the you know what it. What what they are looking for as um, um, as for the decisions they want to to to, to make. Mm -hmm. So you know uh, we are in this situation. So they, they need to put some context. We're in this situation. We don't understand. Uh, we are not sure. Like like first these two words. <laughs> we don't understand, and we're not sure. It's something that you would never heard for uh, hear from from the, the the board or something like that. But uh, let let's say they say it this way. Uh, then you say, oh, okay, so we can probably do like some kind of uh, survey, you know, to find this information uh, on a, a, a panel of both clients and non-clients, because if we are just asked to the clients, we know already that we will bias the data and stuff like that. But no, it's not like that. And I do feel like it's, it's like exactly what happens in many organizations that someone at some point decided that we should do it, you know, through this means because they know only this one, I don't know. And uh, and people just don't uh, question that uh, request. But isn't and the role of the designer to kind of push the boundaries of the, uh, the norm and seek really better, this better future that Mark was talking about, but better means mm -hmm. and challenge the, the status quo? 
Do yes. you think that that's stretching too much and in some organizations is uh, not really welcome? <laughs> in other words, <laughs> can, you, can you say... <laughs> can you can answer yes to both of those. Yes, can you put forward... And yes, you will get pushed back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if it's necessarily expected, but I mean, from the organization point of view, but yes, it, sh it should be the case that we push for, we push the boundaries. Now, um, it's not always well understood why we do it. And I mean, this, you know, is upon us to maybe explain better why, but I, I do think it's not, yeah, it's not necessarily expected. And uh, especially where, uh situations in situations where you know there's some kind of uh process that is uh going on that that you know happened over time like people are asking you for some kind of uh, information about like we in my case by for instance we have people doing only customer insights and they, they do run uh surveys and you know uh, interviews and stuff like that like on a regular basis <clears throat> And so there's some kind of process and sometimes of some types of methods that are already known. And so when the, the board is, or someone in the organization is asking for, for data, they, they are asking for the method that they already heard of, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to, yeah, given the, the, the amount of things that you have to do and, you know, the, the various priorities, sometimes you just don't question it because I do feel like it's what happened. Like at the end of the day, you don't question it because you just have like a pile of other things that you, you need to, to take care of. And it's just another thing on the top. And uh, the effort to just, you know, go back and explain and stuff that unfortunately is sometimes too too high compared to all the other things and what you feel are the priorities. I don't, I don't say it's necessarily good, what I'm saying is just, it's a reality for many of us, right? So, well, yeah, you have to pick your, your battle, right? This is something we, so we well, say. So Talking to some of the people, like, uh, especially hiring folks, they, they say that they expect us, uh, expect the designers to push back and ask more questions. But when we ask questions to the C-suit, for example, the CEO, in my case, it just fires back at me. You know, I think the problem is that 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 the C suit people don't know what we actually do, and they might think that we're just order takers rather than like who's gonna question the status quo and dig deeper into the problem. So hmm. Might be that. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. I I often sometimes wonder though if there's a I don't know whether there's there's a there's probably a reluctance among some, but maybe just a, a lack of. Um, I don't know whether it's skill or familiarity or comfort with that kind of questioning. And I, mean, I was just, just had a call just like earlier today with a mm -hmm. group of people. And I asked them a bunch of questions. They had no answers for anything. Yeah. And I don't know whether they didn't have the answer. They couldn't come up with the answer or somebody didn't want to say the answer because they're worried what somebody else was, but it was, it was remarkable. And of course, the, the, the trick was, I asked the question, there's this awkward silence, and then they asked me another question. <laughs> so, you know, I was able to provide answers to everything, but it, it was rem it's rem but it, it's happened before. And it gets me wondering whether, like, it's like we're set up, not set up to fail, but it's, it's set up with the idea, like, I, I still, I've always believed that people often believe design is plug and play. <laughs> Even if they don't really believe it, like they kind of hope that, you know, that somebody's going to come in there and the ideas are all going to come fast and furious and you'll come up with a product and then, you know, it might not fit perfectly, but you'll just tweak it a little and it'll be good. Yeah. Instead, what they end up getting is like people start asking them questions like, like I asked a question was, <clears throat> they were asking about my approach to, to doing something. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's really critical that that you, because you're doing this for your organization, it was about a well-being project. And, and they said, you know, you, you need to make this visible and, and show people that you actually care. And, you know, I asked them basically, I says, you know, do you, are you, are you committed to seeing this through as a, as more than an initiative, but actual, uh, 
like like no, not just a project that you're going to check off at a <clears throat> of a box. They wouldn't answer. <laughs> they wouldn't because I almost think that there's probably a part of them going, "Oh, that is exactly what we're going to do." Because I don't want to invest three, five years into this stuff. This is something we have to do, and we're mandated to do. We just want to check off the box and go. <laughs> I don't know. You know, after what you said, I, I had this picture of a designer with uh, the guitar, the flame floor guitar, and, you know, in front of the <laughs> truck. Uh, <laughs> <two -year -old. laughs> yeah, Trying know. to break thing, things and, and do it fast, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I agree with, with what you said. Um, it's, um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, uh, like going, it's like going to a horror movie and getting upset because it's scary. And you don't know what's going to happen, and then when something yeah. happens, you're like, <laughs> and yet, that's what you that you you went for. <laughs> mm. One of the things I did at grad school, which was really great, was part of the requirements for the course is we had to teach a design and creativity course on Wednesday nights to uh, like bankers and you know people like that, that that didn't come from that, and it was a really great experience. My teaching partner was a uh, an actual rocket scientist. Um, we had a blast, actually. We had a really good time doing it. But one of the things that we learned out of it was those places are really internally kind of risk averse, hmm. and and it's not a good time. It's it's not a good place to be wrong, right? And so this idea of having any kind of uncertainty or anything like that is a real. It's a culture problem. Right. And so when you, you, you have to like set the culture so that nothing is for sale. Right. It's, it's kind of the thing. I know you do a lot of kind of culture setting and what it is that you're doing, but that that's like one of the big things is that you're coming. And, and also anything that feels like creativity or magic or anything like that is super scary mm. right? to those, to those audiences. And so I find, I mean, the way that I generally break that down, and I'm not like entirely successful about it, but but if I can focus on the goal of what it is that we're trying to do, like what that future outcome is, I can put those questions into the frame of this will be more successful if I know this kind of going forward. And that kind of puts the whole conversation into enabling this solution to happen, right? Because... Because the other one too is the, is the whole you don't need a website or you don't need this feature kind of conversation. You need what this feature does. Mm -hmm. right? So let's not worry about the feature. Let's worry about let's worry about the does. And let's do this. Let's worry about the does together. And if you let me be, and, and I'll play the gesture, right? Like you know what the role of the court gesture was was to you know be funny but also be the one person who could speak truth to the king without getting beheaded, right? <laughs> so. so So in a way, the, where you have this kind of a design as jester role in that in that environment, um, and it actually it actually somehow works in my favor. Like, and I'll come out at the beginning of the at the beginning of any kind of endeavor, even with really big kind of impressive clients. Like, I, I tell them like, we're we're going to be wrong, but us being wrong and you telling us where we're wrong is our way of finding our way through this. Right. And and so, you know, we invite everybody else to be wrong with us. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, I also got in trouble once at, at college for getting my entire class to chant, I'm full of shit. And uh, the school I like, walked by. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I, I became kind of infamous for that particular move. <laughs> and I, I, like, and then it was basically because nobody was talking in class. It was like class number two and everybody was deferring and nobody was pitching in. And so I had to give them the deep, dark secret, which is that everybody's full of shit. And I want you to say, <laughs> I got them all chanting, I'm full of shit. And that's when the director of the school walked by and poked her head in and then said, we should talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be fair, when I told her what I had done and why I had done it, she started laughing hysterically and thought that she would, she said, I, I'm going to follow up with you to see how well it worked. <laughs> <laughs> So she was super cool, but yeah. yeah. But I think I think that's part of it. I think that's part of breaking down that kind of I can't be wrong kind of mentality. You know? 
Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's like anything, like failure, um, creativity, taking risks, all that stuff is a, is much more attractive in the abstract than yeah. it is in reality, like in the oh. sense of... Oh, yeah. On paper. And it, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I, yeah, and I, I think that that's it. And I, so what ends up happening is it's easy to do that when it's a thought experiment. It's a whole other thing when you can sit back there and you have to go back to somebody whether it's whoever that might be, and say, listen, we just invested time, energy, resources, whatever it is, in something that really didn't produce the outcome we thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. We now got to go back and do something else. I, that's hard for people to do. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know? Creativity is great when you come up with a product that everybody absolutely loves and saves tons of money and earns lots of other mm-hmm. money. Creativity is not less, less fun when you're when it's hard <laughs> and, yeah. and the results are unknown well, the results won't be known for another six, eight, 10, 12 months longer. Yeah. Oh, also, um, my experience is when the process is a bit emergent because people really want to have something concrete and solid and know what are we going to do in every single step. But Usually, we, we try to go with the flow, and I can't predict what we are going to uncover. So for them, not knowing how this is going to play is really like yeah. very difficult. Yeah, we, we yeah. have to focus a lot on, the, on making sure that people understand the process rather than the outcome in those very situations. And we had to overcorrect in terms of being really specific about like what the outcome is. Like, we're going to do this. And then we're getting like we're going to have this set of interviews, and we're going to create these mock-ups. But we don't tell them like what it's going to be. We just basically say, look, this is the process that we're going to go through, and we outline the process really clearly, without giving without. So that gives them the anchor point, without mentioning that what happens like within the brackets of what we're doing is we have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We we also suggest the questions. So we usually have like as anchors like two or three questions in each step that we really want to uncover to, mm. to give a pointer of uh, That's good. And, and focus yeah. on the conversation but to predict and have this rigid flow it really is difficult for people to like accept that there isn't such mm-hmm. and we just yeah. need to sit through it and see where we end up yeah, to, yeah. To take a step back to what Cameron was saying about that but how, how yeah, Creativity yes. is nice when there's nothing at stake. There's this kind of, there's how many times have you started like a branding type project where you've explained how important differentiation is and taking a risk and that, you know, like safety is kind of like death and branding and this and that, and they're all gung ho. And then they see like the first set of concepts and then they get like really nervous because they're kind of out there and they don't even want to test them when they go back and then they're like their conservative bias is showing and it's kind of, I mean, I've seen that happen just like a ton. Like they talk at the beginning, you kind of get them all riled up about being different and doing something really exciting, even conceptually kind of outlining what you might do. And then they see it. And the more people see it internally, the, the more everybody starts to get nervous and sweaty. And then it ends up kind of coming back to, you know, the status quo. Yeah. 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 What, what I do. Oh, it's that idea of. What I do see, sorry, there's probably a delay on my side because my connection is not so so great. Sorry for that. Um, um, yeah, what I see often in organizations is like it's not necessarily that people don't n- want to try new things or that they are really afraid about that, but there's no the um, the organization itself is not uh, arranged in a way that allows for that kind of thing to happen necessarily. So even for people that are really really um, willing to try it's often hard for them to find the space to do it the space the time and 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 because they have to convince like a, a bunch of other people to do it uh that they they are not afraid of trying but they are afraid of the consequences that might you know go upon them uh by asking that kind of thing that are that you know are uncommon mm. that are not, not so usual for the organization and it's more like on the side of um, organizational disp- disp- uh, disp- 
dispositionalities, sorry for that, uh, than, uh, than anything else. And I do find really interesting to understand how you can nudge that to, to create more space for, for testing. Um, and yeah, uh, this is something I'm trying to do, to do right now because I, I do, I do, I like, I have a bunch of people that really, really interested to trying things, but they are really not in position to do it. Mm. And, um, and, and, uh, you know, it, it is weird because on, on, um, higher level, everyone is convinced that we, that we should do it. So there's something in between where, where things are not aligned to allow that kind of thing to happen. So that's, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah. And then this is where I'm trying to do like, um, <clears throat> sense making with, with people internally is like understanding where are the, the constraints to, to the organization to, to actually achieve that result, you know, <laughs> being able to try things. Uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah. well, but you know, one of the things is that I think this is where kind of foresight and that ability to be a little bit more future oriented is comes in handy because if you think about most people making a, a risk, like, like, we're humans. I mean, we're, we're not well. We don't think well through time very well. Like mm-hmm. we, we don't we don't see innovations at the time of the innovations we see it now. So, like, mm-hmm. just take Apple. Apple's a great example. Apple's been a great innovator. You don't think tons of people were were just going, oh God, how, what this this? I remember when the iPhone came out. The iPhone, one of the most successful consumer products in terms of profitability driving value, etc., in the history of the planet came out. The, the skepticism, the criticism, nobody's going to use this little black thing that doesn't have keys and it doesn't have this and, and is an enterprise, you know, set up because remember it was Blackberry at the time that was a key thing there. Well, now, you know, that aesthetic is, is, is normal. Like it's, it's kind of most of the, the big key advances, whether it's aesthetics or functionality or usability, were often fought against and, and often weren't even successful at the beginning. And now we just take them for granted. And I think the issue comes down to can you get your client or your leader or your sponsor, whoever's in charge of the product, to think beyond the tension and the, and, and the fear that comes now even the concerns that happen once it launches to give it enough space to say, is this the future? Like, is this going to be the thing in five years? Everyone says, this is the reason why we are the best at whatever. You know, I think the branding is a great example of that. Like, you know, you want to be out there, you got to come up with a brand that reflects that. Yeah. No, I, I don't think. I think. It's, I, th- I just think it's also hard. And plus, it's always a bit of a guess. I mean, think about this: Steve Jobs could have been the guy that just sunk Apple. We could. We could all be sitting there going, "Yeah, I don't even know it." Apple, remember those things? Oh yeah, they were when we were kids. <laughs> we could all be. We could all be sitting here with our flip phones, saying, yeah. "What was that?" <laughs> absolutely, we absolutely could be doing that because. It was a dumb idea, and it didn't take off. And, and whatever it was, he didn't get enough backing to see it through. Or, or, or it was the, you know, the Newton. I, I, this is why Apple. Apple always gets to be a bit cliche, but it's true. Yeah. You look at some of Apple's stuff. The Newton's a great example. The Newton was way ahead of its time. Oh yeah. You know, out, out, aside for for a for a timing perspective, it was just as advanced as the iPhone and the iPad that came after it. But it. It just wasn't ready. People weren't ready for it. Uh, and, and, you know, there were some other things uh, technologically, but ultimately it just didn't take off. Mm-hmm. You know, but it was the, the, it was actually Palm <coughs> that managed to go, there's still something in this. Maybe they don't need a big computer. Maybe if we just made it a little more interesting as a notebook, like literally yeah. the size of a notebook. Mm-hmm. And Palm took off. Palm did fairly well. It just got undercut because the fact is that as it was getting big, the the smart you know people started to switch to smartphones. But, hmm. mm-hmm. you know, but 
back yeah. to what you were saying about time at the beginning time really sucks <laughs> 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 if, you, if you can't get it right yeah. well i mean i i also think it's it's you know part of the problem right now is that you know like it, it's both true and a lie at the same time is that we don't have time it's true in the sense of the cultural expectations like if you look at how long it takes for projects to die i mean the death rate now is it doesn't take long like very few founders leaders managers are willing to stick with something for a long time and yet you know historically i there still is a lot of value in going like Netflix again it's often tech because partly because most of us have had a chance to literally touch something like that but Netflix is a great idea they did mail order VHS things mm. and now up until recently at least they had the biggest lock on eyeballs in in history there's never been a platform that's ever had that many eyeballs on it globally like that's incredible like that but that 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 now that if you even think long, what what is that? Fifteen years? Yeah, that was how long? Like that wasn't even that long when you think about it. But but now, hell, if you if you launch something and it's like, ah, oh, it's, it's been two weeks, <laughs> and it's trending on on this social platform, that's it. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell them they'll see success in ten years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, heck, uh, like Quibi. Did you ever hear of Quibi? Almost no. Quibi was this yeah. massively market like the idea was it was all going to be designed for phones, mm-hmm. uh, entertainment for phones. Like it was all original movies and TV shot mm-hmm. with the idea that people would watch it on its phone. And I often think about that. It died. It died within a year because people didn't. Now part of it was over exuberance. Like there's lots of reasons for that, <laughs> but I still think. I don't know. I mean, not that I want to watch a, a, an original TV series like on a phone that this big, but I, I sit at the coffee yeah. shop and there's tons of people there watching stuff on their phone. Yeah. Well, except that TikTok is yeah. more of a thing, right? But that yeah. that's a so it's not an issue of format; it was an issue of content. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. there's a kind of like homemadeness, unpolished kind of every person kind of aesthetic behind TikTok that that seems to be I don't know de rigueur (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah but I I think what is interesting is generally speaking innovations like what we consider innovations are they exist because a lot of other things existed before that allowed them to be what they became so it's like Apple without all the all the the others that tried things with you know touch screens and and stuff like that and and failed at it. Uh, we wouldn't have like an iPhone uh, product uh, today, and it's the same with uh, with Netflix and uh, streaming services. Like they before Netflix uh, moved to uh, you know streaming service. Uh, they, they were daily motion, YouTube, other things, and uh, although some of them are still here today, um, they didn't invented anything. They just recombi- recombined stuff in a different way, and that's what made them uh, an innovation. Uh, when you look at Apple, you know, products, uh, they had a, a lot of things that just failed, that that were not just good. We, we we assume that they they always made like great products, but it's not true. They they made a, a, a bunch of really not well thought uh, products, and they they failed. And uh, and yeah, despite that, they they're still here. So yeah, yeah just I, I like to see it this way because you know it's often it's it's easier to to narrow something to one event like. Uh, you know the, the Netflix case or the iPhone case. It's those are really interesting yeah. examples. Well, there's, a, there's a worse kind of or a darker side to that too, which is, you know, all these mega companies, these like tech joints that are out there now, are built off of technology that was publicly funded, and none no. of that 
goes back, they don't even pay tax. None of it goes back into the infrastructure mm. that allowed that to happen. Right. So, you know, this whole yeah. Silicon Valley myth that, you know, the real <laughs> innovations come from Silicon Valley and from this kind of not necessarily decentralized, but like plucky startup culture thing is just the most massive lie. These yeah. big technology breakthroughs came from institutionally funded programs like DARPA that built the internet. You know, yeah. And touch screens and you know all that stuff. Like like Elon Musk is some kind of fantastic inventor where he's not. He's a he's a really good marketer and business person and has yeah. the, the stones to abuse legislation so that he can, you know, like I think I just think there needs to be a reset in terms of the way that we think about not just innovation, but the 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 kind of deification of these leaders, you know, as like yeah. you know, big inventors. Yeah. yeah, and and clearly Tesla is a good example where where without government money, they they would not exist at all. Like they they had like so many, um, they were funded like a lot with government money. Yeah. So yeah. without and, it, it, it would have like all, a, of, all of the people sorry? at SpaceX are stolen yeah. from NASA, right? So not only are they like, and NASA budgets and behind it's NASA budgets for, for most of it. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's exactly so, right. And so I think yeah. it's just this, this distortion shield around this stuff that needs yeah. to be laid bare, you know, and, and look, you don't take anything away from the people who have those skills that are able to do that. That's yeah. not, that's not the point of this. It's just that those skills are different than what people are attributing to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I agree. And, um, yeah. It, it, yeah, this I think they, they like it's not new to me. I, I don't remember exactly where I heard this, but you, you know this this is this uh, idea of maybe at some points when when something is becomes so um, like an innovation that everyone is using, and you know uh, should we make it like a, 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 you know some some kind of uh, uh, shared thing like a public thing mm -hmm. and not a private thing like at some point uh and i think it's the discussion behind um also like big uh big tech companies like google and facebook and stuff like that is like uh should we allow them to, to to remain private uh and be only in the interest of their uh you know shareholders uh if it's so largely shared you know and used by so many people around the world Um, but you know, the U S is not a good place for that kind of discussion anyway. So, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think we will have any government interventions at any point <laughs> in the coming years. <laughs> that's not the, that's not the, the way they are used to do it. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, I don't know where where it started necessarily, but there's also the open source community, right? And there's, yeah. you know, IP and that kind of things. And, and, and I think that like, rather than cap the companies, making sure that the technology is open, if your technology is based on government funded work, the requirement to kind of keep that mm -hmm. technology open could be something that could be done. So that doesn't step in the way of profit making or anything like that. It, it, like in terms of the way that you run your business model, but does pass the technology on. So if you take this, this essentially citizen funded work and you improve on it, you're improving on something that's already open source and therefore the licensing is, you know, some kind of continuation. I don't know, like I'm not an expert on this thing, but I think there are other ways to. Yeah. This. Yeah. Then there, there's some legal and regulatory aspects that I, I, I don't say they are necessarily, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, what is the term? Uh, preventing uh, those companies to, to, to keep one, at least a part of the technology uh, public. But, um, but for some, some aspects, they, they don't do it because like, It, it might be perceived as a as a legal risk. Mm. I, I don't know, like if it's always true, but in some cases, it's the kind of logic that goes on. Um, 
And yeah, I, I would say like usually speaking, um, markets are not made for that kind of, they're not made for allowing that kind of thing to happen, uh, you know, uh, really often. They, it's more the exceptions, like you have Wikipedia and stuff like that that are, you know, open source and like really uh, openly shared by, by a large group of people, like a, a community. And and uh, and you have like some other more business that are working this way, but um, but it's more the exception than anything else. So. Yeah. Well, there's there's also a tragedy of the commons type problem with any open yeah. source thing in terms of the maintainers working on stuff for free and a lot of people surfing on that. Yeah. Yeah, and clearly technology in that case. Um, uh, digital technology, especially, they they don't really create opportunities for that kind of thing to happen anyway. So it's like, um, you know, with the reduction of uh, frameworks and, and languages and stuff like that to, you know, uh, minimize efforts and, uh, you know, increase efficiency, then you have a less of diversity. Uh, then you become like, to increase your chances to being stuck into some kind of, um, you know, um, a state where where you rely on a, a few uh, a few technology, but those technologies are uh, locked, and 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 still they are the like the standards because they are the most efficient at doing what you are trying to do. So you kind of feel forced to use them, and so you don't really increase the chances to end up with a world where <laughs> you have more open source technology in the end. So. Um, like yeah, this kind of feedback loops um, that happens. Yeah, and and this is funny because uh, I I do perceive something that um, I do feel like digital technology in general, um, you know, they are, because they are so um, purposeful in the sense that they are made for something specific. Um, they, they don't like it's not like uh, physical objects and stuff like that where it's easier to uh, repurpose something it's it's way more complex to do it in the digital space actually and um, I feel like it, it's it it does not allow necessarily some kind of um, weird and happy accidents in that sense you know whereas two things combined by accident and created something new but really awesome. You know, and uh, something you can see like with physical objects, like you, you, you can you can invent like um, uh, a man with a uh, like a, um, a character with something like that and some other pieces, and you can create something totally unexpected out of uh, this button, which is really really way more harder to achieve with uh, with digital space uh, in that sense because they are so intentful you know, and, and purposeful in that sense. I don't know if it's clear what I'm saying, but uh, I, I do feel it's one of the limitations of uh, thinking only through that uh, technologic uh, lens. don't know what you're say, uh, you are thinking about that. I went too far. <laughs> I think yeah, they are Merci. both indeed intentful and purposeful, but on the other side, you can experiment like there is no tomorrow because the cost of you doing yet one more iteration digitally is like zero. Whereas physically, you know how many cups I have to produce before I'm happy with a, a real <laughs> cup, how I hold it, design dots. I have this dotted mug. Imagine the permutations if it had to be done. Or even I was talking the other day with a, with a friend about running workshops in real life. If we don't like notes, we just delete and put a new note. But physically, how many posts that I have to destroy before I'm happy with uh, whatever I want to maintain on the, on the wall as a comment? It's, uh, mm -hmm. I think it has these two extremes that are exhibited yeah. in the digital. It's very difficult because you have to constantly also change scale from a minor to really mega. And in physical, we are not used to that. Whereas in digital, the scale is almost like time. It's uh, really tricky. <laughs> of what you That's can a do really good point. On a granular basis and the, yeah, the, 
the landscape is like a completely, mm. completely different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think though that um, from a material point of view, there are more hybrid entities out there than ever before, and that'll continue as well, right? That the uh, that the notion of this physical object that is not somehow connected digitally with some, I don't want to, I don't want to say like metaverse type thing, but, but it's, it, you know, it, it is coming to that, mm. right. Like that there are, that there are kind of like, and this is, yeah, it, it's, it's not a, it's going to become more and more rare that things don't have multiple layers to them, which connect them to multiple scales. Mm. Yeah. Whether it's the, you know, barcode on a bottle of wine that, or RFID tag on a bottle of wine that gives you all the information about the terroir and, and all of that to, you know, the, um, the, the, the construction kind of, or what do you call it, like the... Um, Oh, the um, like the, all the, the the shipping and everything that happens with any kind of given object, right? So, so like what the whole supply chain history is of the object yeah. and that kind of thing. That, that these things, or or the idea that these things have digital twins mm-hmm. somewhere, right? That are so. I think that it's all getting more. I think everything is mm-hmm. getting more complicated, right? That we're going to have to start to build imaginations that work at multiple scales at the same time as designers. That, yeah. that's going to be part of the part of the frame that we're going to need to bring to things, right? And I think it's a I think it's a useful frame in some ways because something like circular design, right, is is enabled by that kind of extra layer of information and that re embeds the physical object, even though it's mediated through something um, digital, that it that it kind of re embeds it in its original physical origins. Mm-hmm. In a way, and that that maybe some of this stuff where the physical toll of the digital objects is kind of hidden from us might actually become more uh, tangible, right? Yeah. That, that there might be that that we might be closing a circle a little bit that carry that takes us back to the original or to the to the material origins of the digital world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, that's a great great point, and I, I do find uh, connecting digital to physical to the physical world is a, a, a really interesting uh, thing to do because then you 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 remove one aspect that is uh, rampant in the digital uh, world is the volatility uh, of of anything like the the fact that people can speculate on so many things and stuff like that. When you you anchor digital things into the physical world, you remove you you like you limit that aspect in that sense because things works in a different temporal uh, framework uh, when you are in the physical world. And uh, it also adds more constraints which are yeah. really good for creativity. So yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Well, we, we went yeah. a bit oh. over the, the hour, so I, I don't want to... <laughs> oh, yes. I didn't notice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really great. great. Like, it's, it's yeah. the first, uh, un, you know, really, like, open discussion we, we had, like, for, for, for a while, because we use this um, kind of uh, more directed, uh, in a sense, uh, discussion, like, through the the canvas last time so yeah. like it's good to 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 vary a bit like uh, in terms of, uh, the emergent sessions kevin <laughs> yes. yeah. 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 Sessions. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen but something always happens so yeah I, I, was, I was thinking about that the other day when um i was having a conversation about my dog with somebody else and somehow the idea that dogs are like in the continuous mode of like an improv show Oh yeah, you know, because it's like the dog is always yes and, you know. Kind of thing. <laughs> I can't remember exactly how it came together, but it was a pretty funny conversation. Then I was thinking about it afterwards, like that's kind of what these sessions are. They're kind of like design improv. Like, yeah. You know, if you don't prepare, you know, then it's just like 
discussions off the top of your head that are hanging around. So. Mm. Yeah. But they always do the yes and. Like they always, I, I, I love the, I think this is great. It's, it's really <laughs> nice I was able to make it and good to see everybody. Well, it's how those things connect in each other's head. That's what makes it interesting because you say something and it triggers a thought that I haven't really thought of until I hear it and then something <laughs> begins. Yeah. And Cameron and I had a near miss three weeks ago. Ah, uh, I know. I can, the only time I've ever been away in that <laughs> almost years, in literal, literally years, is that yeah. weekend you came by. I hope that trip went well. Well, I'm still in Montreal. I'm still here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna be back through Toronto on the way back as well. So I'll, I'll, when I know more, it'd be at the end of at the very end of August. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that'll work. That'll, okay. that'll work. I'm gonna say I hope it's not the end of next week because that's the other trip I've got. No, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm leaving. I think I'm leaving. I, it's gonna be like the very very end of August or the first couple of days of September, where however the, the, the dates fall there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very cool. Well, I'm sorry we had the near miss, but that would be great if we could do something. You know, yeah, well, I'm, I'm in, yeah. Now that I'm in the, I'm in Montreal for the summer, so I'm kind of hanging out. I've become, I've become a, a Eastern Time Zone person for three ah. months. <laughs> All right, oh, that's very cool. Nice. Okay, well, take care. You. Yeah, well, thank you. With our yeah. important yeah. conversations. <laughs> yes, bye. thank you for coming. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> bye everybody. Bye.